Hi, I'm Tail of Oigon Mate, and today we replace this workbench with this workbench. The old bench was made by my dad when he was 14 years old, so it has a lot of sentimental value. But the tabletop is tiny, wonky and worn out, and I really need a big and flat surface. I added storage, a router table and made an MFT style tabletop and honestly, after using this workbench, I really don't want the old one back. The build of this workbench can be divided in four steps. The carcass, paneling work, the MFT tabletop and storage. Let's get started. In the same order like I just mentioned, we're starting with the carcass. I'm trying to make this bench as cheap as possible, so I'm using materials I have in the shop. Oh, and if you want to build this workbench yourself, you can find detailed PDF plans and a 3D SketchUp file on my website. I spent a great amount of time on making these plans and I'm quite proud of the result. I kept the reading part to a bare minimum and used dimensioned illustrations to explain how it's put together. There's a link in the top corner and I'll also put all the links in the description. Now let's get back to it. The construction lever I used had some different dimensions, so I first ran them through the planer to get them the same size. In case you don't have a planer, you can make the carcass completely out of plywood. Just use 18mm or 3 quarters of an inch thick plywood and the method I'm using to build this workbench will remain the same. In fact, I think it'd be easier to make the workbench completely out of plywood because you can start with a flat and straight material. But as I said before, I'm using whatever I have on hand. Now they're the same size, it's time to cut the pieces at their final length. And as you can see, I don't have a fancy table saw, so I use a clamp as a stop block. When that's done, it's time to make a recess in some of the pieces of the sides. And as you can see, they'll be made with layers glued on each other and the recess we're making here is to fit the long stretchers to connect the sides and act as a support for the tabletop and the base plate. <gasps> you might have no clue what I just said, but stick with me and you'll see. I start with cutting the majority on the table saw to ensure a straight cut and finish with a hand saw to remove the last part. To clean up the corner with a chisel, I clamp these four pieces together because it makes it easier to keep your chisel flat. And after a test fit with the double stretchers, they seem to fit. For the bottom side I used a single stretcher, so as you can see the recess here is smaller. For me this will be plenty strong, but if you want you can use double stretchers here as well. It's time to glue the sides together. It seemed easier to me to start with the vertical pieces and adding the horizontal pieces in a second glue up. Make sure to use enough glue and especially enough clamps. A few hours later the glue is dry enough to remove the clamps and add the horizontal pieces. Now the other reason I did this in two times is because I didn't have enough clamps to do it all at once.
After checking for square I added the last clamps and let it dry overnight. When the glue is dry I take the sides to the drill press and drill some dog holes with a Forstner bit. The bench dogs I'll be using here will act as a support when clamping things to the bench vertically. And because I want to be able to unclamp without the need to take away the clamp, I decided to use a T-track with a lever clamp for guide rails. So I marked and routed the groove to fit the T-track. These are the long stretchers I talked about before. I'm making a recess for some cross stretchers to sit in with a half lap joint. After that I'm doubling them up by gluing two pieces to each other for extra strength. Now I have to make the other side of the half lap, so I mark the section I need to cut on the cross stretcher and cut it away with the same method I used before. Here I'm drilling some pocket holes which you'll notice along the video I use a lot. This is because the workbench needs to be able to be taken apart for when I'll be moving out of this workshop in the future. I'm currently working at the attic of my father's house and I'm not planning on staying here forever. By placing the pocket holes on well thought locations and more importantly using them in combination with the paneling work you'll see in the next step, this will make sure the workbench is extremely robust and stable. You can also use regular screws here instead of pocket holes, the only downside to this would be your screws being visible. I added 4 caster wheels of 100mm or 4 inch, which I find the perfect height to freely move your feet when working at the workbench. I'm using MDF for the tabletop as well for the base, combining a new sheet of 18mm for the top and a big piece of the same kind of MDF that's been laying around the shop catching dust and being thrown on the old workbench when I needed a flat surface. Since the base is within the structure it can't be made of one piece. I'm using three pieces because I'm working with leftovers but you could make it with two pieces. Just make sure to place the cut right above a cross stretcher to support the entire length of the cut. You could make it even stronger by adding some biscuit or dominoes, just don't use glue if you want to be able to take it apart in the future. Then I just attach it to the frame with pocket holes and screws from above. You might think I could do this with less screws, but I wanted to be sure that it's strong and not making any crackling noises when I move it around or work on. It's time to change the structure into a real workbench and finally attach the tabletop.
So because the paneling work is basically just cutting, drilling and screwing things together, I'm not going to show you all of this in this video. Instead, here's a drawing which shows all the sheets I've attached. I do go over this subject a little more in the workbench plans. Alright, storage. I've cut all the pieces for the storage and sustainer drawers and started with some quick sanding of the insides. If you'd sand them after they're assembled, you wouldn't be able to reach those inner corners. And yes, everyone knows, but still everyone forgets. Only this time, I thought ahead. If you like this video so far, and would like to see more videos like this in the future, please hit that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. You know, those clicky things beneath the video. Anyway, here my vacuum cleaner is sniffing a line um, of dust. I wouldn't want you to have wrong thoughts. I just like to keep my shop clean, that's all. So you just saw me making some drawers with pocket holes and a groove to slide the bottom in. And I think this goes without saying. Just drilling, grooving and sliding things into place. To attach the drawer guides on the right height, I cut some scraps as spacers to temporarily place them in between and let the guides rest on. I just screw them in place with regular screws using the intended holes. For the drawer above, I did the exact same thing but cut some new spacers and placed them in between. For the storage drawers, I used the same technique but placed some spacers between the drawers themselves. If you're making a workbench with the drawer slides, I'd recommend to avoid using those push to open drawer guides. Since you're moving around a lot at a workbench, there's a chance you'll bump into your drawer fronts, causing them to open while you're handling machines and sharp tools. And I guess you'll want to avoid that. I must say, there's a certain satisfaction in seeing a nearly finished workpiece in its intended place. Even though it's not finished just yet, I was really happy to see how everything was coming together. Next we'll be making the drawer fronts and handles. I wanted to try something subtle with color on the workbench, so I used the handles as color coding. I cut them to size and marked where the handles will be. To make the hole, I started with drilling two holes with a Forstner bit and cut away the majority with a jigsaw. Using double sided tape, I taped a straight edge as a guide to route the handles nice and straight. I'm using my old router table, which is basically a piece of plywood with a hole in it. There's nothing fancy to that, so I guess I don't have to tell you how much I'm looking forward for the new router table in the workbench. Using a flash trim bit, I route the edge straight, followed by a chamfer bit to create a recess for the fingers to grab on. And I routed this chamfer in two times, because it felt like the bit grabbed too much on the material. I think I should have sped up the router to avoid this. And lastly, I used the round over bit to smoothen the edge.
In 3 minutes this video is about to end. The last steps in this build speak for themselves and don't need my voice to explain every bit. It's mainly mounting the drawer fronts and marking and drilling the dog holes in the tabletop. And they might not be dead on, but it's impressive how precise something can be if you just take your time and don't rush. As for my dad's workbench, we donated the bench to a school where my brother teaches. This workbench had a lot of history, but nothing's gone. In fact, it's continuing making history as we speak. Because maybe, one of these kids will find out he loves working with his hands. As for my new workbench, well, its history pages are blank ready to be filled with everything you'll see me making on this channel. And I might need your help with that, so I hope you'll follow me along this journey. If you want to see part 2 of this workbench build on how I made the router table in the workbench, there will be a link to this video in the top corner and in the description below. Thank you for watching and see you on the next one.